Hello. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Claire Coughlin and I'm the clinical lead for Bowel Cancer UK. I'm also a consultant nurse in colorectal cancer and I am delighted um, to be here with you this evening hosting our event um, about having investigations for bowel cancer. The reason we know it's important for us to host this event tonight is that people have told us and we completely understand that thinking you've got signs or symptoms that might be worrying for bowel cancer um, makes you people understandably worried and being referred for medical investigations also can be stressful and worrying. Um, and people always um, in my profession as a nurse and here at the charity ask for more information um, so they know what to expect and we know that can be helpful. So I'm delighted um, to be here this evening and I will have a, fan I have a fantastic speaker to introduce to you. First of all, I've got to do something called the housekeeping. This is the bit I like least, um, but it's just uh, to help you find your way around um, and uh, be able to introduce yourselves to us and ask us questions if you'd like to. So at the bottom of your screen, um, you will see a couple of things. So the first thing is a chat box. And if you click on that, if you're in full screen, it will come up as a box and you, you can move it around. Or if you're not in full screen, it will be on the right hand side and you can introduce yourself. Some of you have already found it. You can say hello to us. Um, tell us who you are if you want to or just say hi. So that's the first box. The second one is the Q&A box. So that will be on the bottom bar as well. Um, and that one is really important because if you want to ask us any questions as the evening goes on, that is where we need you to put your questions, please. As the host, I can't see your question in, in the chat box. So I need to see in the, the Q&A box. It's confidential. Um, nobody will be able to see it. Um, so please do use the Q&A again. It will if you're in full screen, you can move it around. And if not, it will stay in the, on the right hand side of your screen. Um, we are recording this evening's event, um, but again, it will be completely confidential. Um, so please don't be worried about that. Um, we will also, when the event is finished, send you a survey. And that's really helpful to us here if you can if you can complete it, because it tells us how helpful you found the event and if there's anything you'd like us to do in the future, um, or if there's anything we could have done better. So please do um, fill that out. And we will also email you the link to the recording um, so that you can watch it back at your leisure if you want to. Now, before I introduce um, Harriet, who's our speaker to you, um, I'd just like to do um, a couple of polls, if that's all right. So we've got a fantastic tech crew, th thankfully, working behind the scenes, and they're going to bring up the first poll, um, which is, where are you joining us from today? So can you tell us where you are today, um, where you're watching from? Um, you don't have to do these. They're not compulsory. Um, so we've got some people in England, Wales, uh, no one in Scotland yet. Um, but people might might join us from there. So that's fantastic. It's good that we've got people in England and Wales and there might be some other nations joining us in a while. OK, so how many of you are watching um, today? Um, hang on. Sorry, I might have the polls in the wrong order. The next one is oh, how many people are you watching with? Is it just you? Um, is it, are you with somebody else or are you with a couple of people? Um, so are you on your own or have you got a partner or a friend with you? So if you can tell us that, that's brilliant. I'm not getting any. Oh, yeah. People watching on their own mainly. OK. Fabulous. Um, and of those of you who are, there's, I don't think there is anybody watching with anybody else. So we'll end that one and then move on to our final poll. Um, which is which of the below best describes your situation? So are you somebody who's thinking you might have symptoms or have you already been along to your GP? Have you had some tests um, or have you got um, something that you have regular tests for? OK. So I'll just give that. So mo OK, so most of you have all have been referred um, and um, a couple of people who are waiting for test results. Great. OK, so we will have really helpful information for you this evening. So that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so now I'm absolutely delighted that I'm able to introduce um, our speaker for this evening. Um, her name is Harriet Watson. 
Um, and Harriet is a colorectal consultant nurse and a clinical endoscopist at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, Harriet has looked after colorectal cancer patients for over 30 years. Um, and uh, she's clinical lead for the two week wait suspected colorectal cancer pathway. Um, she has an absolute wealth of experience. Um, I can see her there now on the screen. Um, so <laughs> Harriet's worked for NHS England as a clinical advisor on colorectal cancer diagnostics. She's led telephone assessment and straight to test pathways, decreasing time for diagnosis to colorectal cancer patients, for colorectal cancer patients, which is such, such important work. Harriet is a very experienced clinical endoscopist and co-developed and delivered the first Health Education England Clinical Endoscopist National Training Programme. Her specialist area of specialist interest is early age onset colorectal cancer and use of fit. And I know she'll explain more to you in a minute about what that means. So thank you very much, Harriet. Welcome. I shall hand over to you. Thank you, Claire. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, perfectly. That's great. We've had a few audio tests that have uh, been challenging, but I think we're OK. So um, thank you. What an introduction. Thank you so much, Claire. So um, as Claire said, my name is Harriet, Harriet Watson, and I'm a consultant nurse um, in um, Guy's and St. Thomas's in London, and I work in a colorectal surgical team. Uh, and I've done uh, this role for many years, having looked after colorectal cancer patients, as Claire says, for about 30, 25, 30 years now. So hopefully there isn't a question I haven't yet heard, um, but I'm happy to be challenged. So by all means, think of some questions. Um, and uh, uh, my aim today is to try and help answer those for you and try and allay any anxieties and worries that you have um, and try and help you along your uh, journey with your investigations. So um, let me just find a way to control these. Uh, are there with me? Is that taking me? Yeah, great. So today's session, we're going to um, talk about a little bit, as Claire said, um, what to expect if you visit your GP with symptoms. So it might be that you're thinking, um, I've got symptoms, I don't know whether to go to my GP or not. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, then just describe a little bit about what the type of test you might experience if your GP then refers you into hospital on the suspected bowel cancer pathway um, and what that might mean for you. Uh, and the different health professionals that you might meet if that does happen to you. Who, who might you see, who might be um, involved in assessing you and, and investigating you and speaking to you about your potential diagnosis? Um, and then we'll join together with Claire to talk about um, the next steps and support for you following that. Um, whether you have a diagnosis of bowel cancer or not, because sometimes you're left with symptoms, you don't have a diagnosis um, and you don't know quite what to do then. So we hope to, to cover all of those things. So we know um, that having bowel symptoms causes stress and worry. Uh, we absolutely know that. And we know that it can be extremely difficult knowing how to navigate your way around our um, healthcare system, particularly in, current, in the current climate. There's lots of issues in primary care that can make this challenging. Um, and there's uh, obviously ongoing issues with hospital care sometimes with, with regard to access in some places. So we know that it causes stress and concern. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we just want to be able to try tonight to try and put your mind at rest about a few things that you might be stressed or anxious about or just want further information about. So acknowledging to yourself that you even have symptoms that, that should be investigated, we know is, is stressful. Um, it's easy to bury your head and not think about them. It's a much easier option than to face them and decide that you need to go and see somebody um, and get yourself checked out. Seeking medical help can be very stressful and causes lots of anxiety. Uh, and being referred, obviously, for investigations is also um, can be a concern for people. You don't know what that's going to involve and you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So we want to be able to hopefully put your mind at rest a bit about that. Waiting for results can be very, very difficult for people. You don't know how long you're supposed to wait. You don't know when to start chasing results. And we hope that we can give you a bit of information about that as well, as well tonight. We know that if you have this knowledge, um, you tend to feel a bit more in control of what's happening to you. Um, and that helps to just allay your anxieties. So we feel that if we can uh, arm you with a bit of knowledge and a bit of um, information about what to expect, then hopefully we can help to put your mind at rest about a few things. So I'm just going to talk a little bit now about the symptoms of bowel cancer. And it might be that you've experienced some of these if you have um, been referred. 
Um, so let's just talk about those for a moment. So these are the most common causes of bowel, um, of bowel cancer, uh, sorry, about most common symptoms of bowel cancer. But of course, um, and I'll come on to talk about this a little bit in a minute, bowel symptoms are very common in the population. And most people that have bowel symptoms don't have bowel cancer. But if your symptoms are persistent, they, you, they shouldn't be ignored. You really should get somebody um, to, to, to talk to about them and somebody to examine you. And of course, the most natural person is your GP. But even if you start to talk to somebody else about them, once you've acknowledged them um, and you've accepted that they haven't started to clear up and they are a problem, uh, that's your first step into maybe getting some help. Um, so talk to somebody, even if, even if you don't want to talk to your GP straight away, tell your family member or a good friend or a good colleague that you've been having some problems um, and they can help support you. So rectal bleeding is a difficult one. Rectal bleeding is very common and the most common cause of rectal bleeding is hemorrhoids, piles, which I'm sure most of you have heard about. But if you have persistent rectal bleeding that isn't clearing up and it's not associated with pain in your bottom and it appears to be mixed in with your stools rather than separate from your stools and isn't just a bit of fresh, tish, uh, fresh bleeding on the tissue, then that, that should be reported to somebody, to your GP. If you've had a persistent change in the way your bowels function, so people's bowels can be erratic from time to time. Everybody gets a slight change in their bowel function and usually it returns to some kind of normal pattern after a while. If it's due to something that's not, uh, um, not dangerous, not sinister or not, not, that doesn't need checking out. So if you have had a persistent change in bowel habit, that's when we say go and speak to your GP and get, get some support and get some advice. Abdominal pain is a tricky one and often is a later symptom of bowel cancer, but it's not always. And obviously, bowel, abdominal pain can be caused by lots of other things, um, irritable bowel, diverticular disease, lots of things cause tummy pain. And the persistent nature of them, again, is key. If you've had weight loss, it's unexplained. So you haven't been deliberately trying to lose weight or you haven't got another uh, specific reason, such as recent stress or bereavement or something that's that you feel could explain your weight loss, then that should be uh, um, discussed with your GP. If you have an unusual lump or mass on your tummy or around your bottom, again, that should be brought up with your GP so that you can be checked out. Iron deficiency anemia, so that's when your blood count is low, is a difficult one because you wouldn't necessarily know that you were anemic. But if you start to feel tired without any real explanation as to why, or you feel a bit short of puff, and it can mean that your red cells, your haemoglobin is low or your iron is low. Um, and you should report that to your GP so they can take some blood tests for you. And as uh, Claire mentioned at the beginning, one, one of my areas of specialist interest is in um, early age onset. And that's younger people with bowel cancer. And we talk about younger people with bowel cancer as being people under 50. Um, bowel cancer has historically always been a condition or a disease of older people but certainly over the last 10 years globally we've seen an increase in younger people presenting with bowel cancer so don't think just because you're younger that if you've got persistent bowel symptoms you're too young to get bowel cancer because we know that that's not true it is still rare in younger people um, certainly less so than in older people but it is still a disease that younger people can have so please don't think that that's a reason not to go to your GP. Uh, so we've covered some of this. So the most common symptoms can be attributable to many things. And of course, hemorrhoids, irritable bowel syndrome are far more common than bowel cancer. But we don't want you to put off seeing your GP because you think that it's due to those uh, instead of bowel cancer. If you've had persistent symptoms, we would always advise that you go and see your GP or seek help from somewhere. So what, do you, what should you expect when you visit your GP with symptoms? We know that, um, as I've mentioned, having bowel symptoms is, is, can, can be a concern if they haven't um, cleared up after a while. And if you've had a, a close family member with bowel cancer, it's even more important that you report your symptoms. If you've recently taken part in the National Bowel Cancer Screening Programme, um, and you have had a negative result, but you then later develop symptoms, it's still really important that you seek some help. 
We don't want you to be falsely reassured by something if your symptoms uh, develop in there are persistent. You definitely shouldn't feel like you're wasting your GP's time. You're never, nobody's going to be berated for seeing a GP about something that turns out to be um, something that's not, not serious. Uh, GPs would much rather treat people that don't have to be referred on for bowel cancer and reassure you that all is okay. So please don't think you're wearing a GP's time. It's really helpful if you can make um, some notes um, you can keep a, a symptom diary and Bowel Cancer UK has a really good sample of this. So do go on the website and have a look. And we definitely recommend that you see your GP within three weeks of noticing some symptoms. So that persistent nature of your symptoms, we, we say, is around three weeks or longer. Uh, we've talked about bleeding. So if you've had bleeding, again, you must uh, report that if it's persistent. Um, and if you have been to see your GP and your symptoms haven't settled, but you feel that GP has said that you're okay, then do go back. If you feel something isn't right, go back to your GP if, if, if you feel like you, you haven't had the satisfactory outcome that you'd hoped. So as we, we've talked about many of these things, the persistent nature is very key. Bowel symptoms are very common. There's multiple different reasons for them, and most people that have bowel symptoms don't have bowel cancer. Your GP, when they see you, We'll take a clinical history, and that means asking you questions about your symptoms, how long you've had them, what type of symptoms you've had, so what type of bleeding you've had, what type of changes to your bowel function you've had, whether you've had any pain, whether you've lost any weight, whether you have a family history of any bowel conditions, um, whether you've had um, any other symptoms at all, um, such as you're off your food, you feel very tired, um, many of the things that I've mentioned. They may well examine you if it's a face-to-face -face appointment rather than over the telephone. So they might do an examination of your tummy, that's your abdomen, and sometimes they might do an examination of your rectum with a finger. So that will be um, a, a, a gloved finger with some cold jelly, and it only takes a few minutes. Obviously, it's not particularly pleasant, but it's really important and gives us lots of information. So try, try not to worry about that. It's a really quick, simple test. Um, and is very important if they're concerned about you having bowel cancer. You might have some blood taken, uh, and that will help to determine whether or not you're anemic or whether or not there's any other problems. Um, and the most important thing is that if you go to your see your GP with bowel symptoms, and if they haven't suggested it, that you ask your GP to carry out a poo test called a FIT. And we're going to go and talk about that now. So FIT stands for Fecal Immunochemical Test, and it's a test that looks for blood in your poo. And it's a very sensitive test and it's very accurate at detecting human hemoglobin in your poo. So there have been previously been tests that pick up blood in your poo, but they're not as um, accurate as this, not as sensitive as this. And they would pick up blood even if you'd had a very rare steak or you'd brushed your teeth and you'd had some gum bleeding, that kind of thing. So this is a very sensitive test for picking up bleeding from the bowel. And the number that you get when you are told you've got a positive fit is important. So if it's under 10, and this is a, this is a fit test that's taken as part of um, uh, what we call a symptomatic fit test. So you've had symptoms and you're going to a GP and they give you a fit. Um, the fit levels that are used in screening are different. They're slight less, but the, the sensitivity is, is higher. So if you've had symptoms, it's set at 10. So if it's under 10, uh, that means it's negative. And if it's over 10, then technically that's positive. But the, the numerical value helps us to triage the severity of your potential bleeding. So if you've got a fit test that's sort of over 200, then we would say that's probably uh, from, a cause, from a cause of bleeding. And obviously we do get some patients that have an, a positive fit and it turns out there's nothing of concern and it can be hemorrhoids that have contaminated the fit test or there can be some other cause of bleeding that's contaminated the fit test. But it's still important if you've had a positive fit result that that is followed up and investigated. And that's a really helpful tool for us um, if, you've if you've not had bleeding, if you've had a change in bowel function, because it helps us determine and triage you for your investigations. So if you have a fit and it's positive, your GP should refer you on this two-week wait suspected bowel cancer pathway. 
Now, your GP can still refer you if your fit is negative, if your GP is concerned about your symptoms and they have been persistent and you have had symptoms that they feel need, still need investigating, particularly if, for example, you're losing weight or you're anemic. But it means if your fit is negative, then it's possible the cause is coming from something other than within your, your colon, your bowel. So you have a positive fit or you have persistent symptoms and your GP is going to refer you to the hospital. So we're going to talk a little bit about what, what might happen um, if you're referred to a, also a, another colorectal department. So your referral normally would go to what we call the colorectal two-week wait pathway. Um, and most hospitals these days offer what's called a straight-to-test investigation. So very often, and I know that both Claire and I's hospital offer what's called um, a, a telephone assessment appointment. So you're referred to the um, cancer, the main cancer office, who then appoints you to a telephone clinic. And at that telephone clinic, we we call you. So you have a designated appointment as if it was an outpatient appointment seen face to face, but it's over the phone. So it's not an ad hoc phone call. You'll know when to expect it and you'll know um, you're, it's, it's like an appointment. And we call you and we do what's called a, a clinical clerking over the telephone. So take a history, a bit like your GP, but perhaps with a little bit more detail, a bit more focus on um, your bowel and your symptoms. And then depending on the outcome of that assessment, we will book you for a, a diagnostic bowel investigation. So some kind of test. And we're going to go on, talk, go on, we're going to, go on to talk about those now. This straight to test pathway just means you've got lot, you haven't got lots of unnecessary appointments backwards and forwards to the hospital just to be told you need a test. We can do it over the phone, book you in for your test and get that test hopefully done within the two weeks. That, that being called the two week wait pathway. Uh, and the type of test you offer depends on many factors and we're gonna talk about some of those now. So by far the most common test is a colonoscopy, which you might have heard of, and that's a camera test into your bowel. It's a small, thin camera, and it's no bigger than your finger, and it's certainly much thinner than passing a poo. And it's a camera that looks inside, in, goes into your rectum, and looks around your, bowel, your, your colon, your large bowel. It takes about half an hour. Um, it usually involves you having some laxatives prior to the procedure, uh, and I know lots of people have anxieties about this and concerns and it's ne nearly always the biggest concern for people so taking the laxatives is um, ca can be a challenge they do deliberately give you very watery stools so that the bowel is completely empty of poo so that when we come to do the test we can see inside if the, if the bowel is full of poo we just can't see anything and it's a kind of futile diagnostic procedure for you so we need the bowel to be empty and we give you some dietary advice to follow the day before. So we get you to cut out fibre for a few days because that fills the bowel up. And we give you a diet called low residue diet, which absorbs in the, in the gut, in the small bowel, higher up, leaving the bowel nice and empty for us to see with the camera. The laxatives can be difficult to take. Sometimes there's a large volume of, of fluid uh, and you can dilute them with squash and you can keep them nice and cold in the fridge to make them as palatable as possible. Um, but certainly they are an important part of this procedure because without that, the diagnostic value of the test is reduced. You're offered sedation, so intravenous sedation if you'd like it. Um, there are alternatives. So you can have gas and air, which is like a, um, you might have in A&E if you've hurt yourself or some ladies have when they have a baby. Um, and some people have it without anything. But IV sedation is a very common um, procedure a very common way to have this procedure done and it does mean that you're nice and relaxed both for yourself and for us and it helps us to do the test for you you do usually have to have somebody to take you home afterwards we can't let you go home unaccompanied because you'll be a little bit sleepy and you do have to have somebody with you for 24 hours afterwards it, as i said it's an outpatient procedure it takes about half an hour and we usually can give you the results of the test on the day unless we've taken biopsies, in which case we have to wait a few days for those to come back. But we'll always be able to tell you what we've biopsied, what we've sampled. So a biopsy is a sample of tissue. So looking at this diagram, you can see that the, the, bowel goes in, the camera goes into your bottom, down at number six, um, and around your rectum, around that, that squiggly bit of your bowel called the sigmoid colon. And if you've been told you're going to have a sigmoidoscopy, it goes up to about four, maybe a little bit up into that top corner. 
Um, but if you're having a colonoscopy, it goes all the way around the, the bowel there, right round to number one, which is the cecum. So that darker green uh, organ is your colon, your large bowel, and in the middle, that's your small bowel. And we're talking just about your large bowel today, your colon. And a CT colonography is what we call a virtual colonoscopy. So some of you may have heard of that. And it's a really good alternative to a colonoscopy. Um, it's essentially um, a sophisticated scan. So a sophisticated photograph of your bowel and your abdomen and your pelvic areas. Um, it's a CT scan, like the one you can see below. Um, and it takes lots of cross-sectional pictures of your insides, particularly focusing on your large bowel. And your rectum, and you'll have again some um, maybe some preparation prior to it in terms of a laxative, but it's not usually as strong as the laxative you take for the colonoscopy. And you'll have a special dye drink to take the day before, which helps us to identify any stool in the bowel, and we can then see the difference between stool and any abnormalities. It is diagnostic only, so if we find anything on the colonography, you still then might need a camera test afterwards to take samples. But it is a less invasive procedure and it's less demanding on your body if you have any problems um, such as mobility or you live on your own or there's restrictions in you being able to take the laxative. Uh, some people with poorly kidneys can't take the laxative because it is very dehydrating and can affect your kidneys a bit. Uh, you still have to have a little plastic tube in your bottom. It isn't a camera, so it doesn't go all the way up inside and around, but it just sits in the rectum to put some air through the bowel. And that just helps us to see around all those loops and bends and all those um, folds in the bowel that you can't necessarily see. It's a bit like a deflated tire and we need to open it up and see down the middle. But virtual colonoscopies aren't currently available in all hospitals, although it is increasingly um, available in, in most now, nowadays. The colon capture is probably our latest addition to our diagnostic test. Um, and this is a very little clever, very clever little pill cam, um, which is an alternative to having an invasive colonoscopy. You still have to have lots of strong laxatives prior to it because we need the bowel even more super clean because we can't wash anything away with the pill cam. So um, you have to be able to take the laxatives in order to have this test. It is diagnostic only again, so we can't take samples. And again, if anything is found, you might need to still, might still need to have the camera test afterwards. And again, this is more widely available than it used to be, but it's not necessarily available in every hospital still yet. It's a very clever little thing and it, you swallow it and it goes all the way down your gullet into your stomach and then travels around your small bowel and your large bowel. And you can have a, cam, a colon capsule um, you can have a, um, a capsule that investigates the whole of your tract from your mouth to your anus, or you can have capsules that investigate just the top and the bottom of your bowel. But in this context, because we're talking about bowel cancer investigations, it would be a colon capsule to investigate your colon, your large bowel. And that's looking at that area in sort of dark pink there. It looks a bit like this. Uh, and when you have the pill cam, you carry a little data recorder on a belt like in the diagram and it travels through your bowel, as you can see. And it's no more, it's no bigger than a kind of a large paracetamol capsule. Uh, we then collect all the pictures in the data recorder from the little pill cam and then we um, review those pictures once the pill cam has passed through your bowel. So it's a very clever little bit of technology um, and it's a good alternative if you're not keen on having an invasive procedure as your first test. Uh, and if you if you're interested in this, uh, do ask your hospital team about it if you've been referred uh, and they hopefully will be able to tell you a little bit more. So you come into hospital and you've had your diagnostic tests um, and then you want to know what's going to happen then. That can be the most daunting bit. What are your results and who are you going to see to, to talk to you about your results? So the, the specialist nurses that you will see will, re, will range from the nurses that you speak to on the phone at the very first contact with the hospital right through to if you have bowel cancer diagnosed and you then have to have treatment right through to the team that look after you on the wards. But in the context of this talk, and we're talking really about sort of diagnostic stages of your journey, the first nurses that you will encounter will be people like myself or Claire who are taking your assessments. Um, making your referral to the diagnostic test and arranging your diagnostic test for you. 
and maybe doing them for you. So I myself carry out in the colonoscopy procedures and I train lots of nurses and doctors to do the procedures. So you'll see staff like us in the endoscopy unit when you come in for your test. If you're then diagnosed with bowel cancer, you will see the team of clinical nurse specialists. And I have to just say that today is National uh, Cancer Clinical Nurse Specialist Day, and we've been celebrating that in the hospitals today. So um, they're an extremely important part of the team and an extremely important part of your journey if you are given a diagnosis of bowel cancer. They are your key worker and your absolute linchpin through this journey. They are the people that will contact you and you contact them if you have any questions, concerns, anxieties, anything at all. And they're an incredible team of nurses. We won't talk in too much depth about the rest of the nurses that you'll see um, because it's a little bit outside of the remit of this talk, but you will see teams of nurses as you go through your journey if you are then given a diagnosis of bowel cancer. The medical team that you will see will once again be endoscopists. Um, both nurses and doctors do the procedures and are all trained to the same level and work at very similar levels. You might see the radiologists that carry out your scans or, or give you the capsule procedures. That's usually a nursing team. Um, then if you, obviously if you're then diagnosed with bowel cancer, you might see the surgeon and their team um, and the anaesthetists will be involved in that part of your care as well. Later on, if you need to, you might see oncologists, that's the cancer doctors and the team that they work with. And a very important part of the team is the psychologists, the dietitians, and the physiotherapists that look after you throughout this journey uh, as part of your treatment and as part of your ongoing care. Every single person who's, who's given a diagnosis of bowel cancer will have access or offer the support of a psychologist. And we strongly advise that that's utilised and really helps you to cope with your diagnosis and your journey afterwards. So what happens when you are then um, given your diagnostic results and, um, and you, you are waiting to be told what happens with your care? So you should be, if you're referred on the two-week wait pathway, you should be given your results within 28 days of referral, and that's a national standard. Uh, we try very hard to meet it, and it's not always possible, but if we can't meet 28 days, then we certainly do aim to, to give you a diagnosis as soon as that, as close to that 28 days as, as possible. If you've had various tests and you've been told maybe that you, you, you have something that's been biopsied and, and um, some scans and various tests, uh, and awaiting a decision, all of your results will be discussed at what's known as the multidisciplinary team meeting, where a team of all the people that we've just mentioned in the previous slides will be there to give a consensus decision on the best treatment for you as an individual. So whilst we have standards of care that we, that we have to um, adhere to, everybody's care is slightly different and everybody's care is, is tailored to them. And that's what happens at the multidisciplinary team meeting. And patients don't need to attend that, but the clinical nurse specialists are there as your advocate. They're there to support you and to, to, to be there on your behalf. Um, and then you'll be uh, um, seen in the clinic afterwards, probably by a surgeon and, and a team of nurses, specialist bowel cancer nurses, to have that NDM discussion um, explained to you and what we advise in terms of the outcome and what will be the best in your best interest for your type of diagnosis because everything is different everybody's different and from there you have your treatment and surgery explained and planned and you should start to, to be given dates about when things will happen for you and once again uh, absolutely key is the contact details for the specialist bowel cancer nurses so if you haven't had that given to you then please ask um, because it absolutely should happen at that stage. So I'm going to hand over to Claire now because she's going to talk a little bit about what support is available for you through other means other than the hospital and in particular through um, Bowel Cancer UK. Thank you so much Harriet, that was great talk and we'll chat more at the end I know. Um, so yeah as Harriet said I'm going to talk a bit more about the support that's available for, um, for you. Um, whether you're diagnosed with bowel cancer or not through Bowel Cancer UK. But the first thing I would say is if you are, are given a diagnosis of bowel cancer, 
please do use your specialist nurses that Harriet just talked about. People have, I've been a specialist nurse for many years and people always say to me, but I thought you were so busy and I didn't want to, to worry you. That That's exactly what we're there for. So please, please do use those contact details for your specialist nursing teams because they will always want to hear from you and, and are always there to help, um, as are Bowel Cancer UK. Um, so there's lots of support available through the charity, and I'm going to talk through some of that now. Um, so we have excellent health information. So for before you're diagnosed, so if you're worrying about signs and symptoms that may or may not be um, signs of bowel cancer and thinking that you might need some tests, come onto our website. And um, there's information, Harriet's spoken about some of it earlier, about visiting your GP, about the hospital tests, about your medical team and questions that are suggested for you to ask at your hospital appointment. Um, and it's really useful to think through that before you go along. Um, and we've got lots of information um, to help you with that when, when you do um, go along to your hospital appointment. So jot things down, think them all through. Um, we've also got an emotional wellbeing hub, um, which talks about how, how to cope with the diagnosis telling people about your diagnosis and about managing that natural fear and anxiety and that's com it's completely normal to feel worried um we there are, there's lots of information and um, to help you to cope with that um also in our health information um section as really really well written booklets um, and fact sheets so they're all um written by um, specialists in bowel cancer, but also by patients who know what this is like. They've contributed to it and read through and made sure that they're accurate and that they're very clear to understand. So there's one about your pathway. So if you have a new diagnosis of bowel cancer, it tells you exactly as Harriet's just explained what to expect next. There's another booklet about your operation. So it may be if you're diagnosed with bowel cancer, that you need to have an operation. That's that's fairly common as a treatment for bowel cancer, very common. So we've got an excellent booklet about that. There's another one about eating well. Um, so when you've had a diagnosis of bowel cancer or after treatment for bowel cancer, people often worry about the right things to eat. And that um, booklet is excellent and gives you lots of advice. Um, Sometimes people are diagnosed with advanced bowel cancer, and we have a booklet um, that gives you more information about that. The most, we know that the thing that perhaps reduces anxiety best is information and knowledge. So please do use these resources. That they, they really, it really, you may well find them so helpful in making you feel a little bit more in control of what's happening. So please do use them. We've got another excellent publication on younger people with bowel cancer and the specific issues placed um, faced by people that are diagnosed with bowel cancer at a younger age. And as Harriet said, um, it, it's not as uncommon as you may think, um, and younger people can be diagnosed with bowel cancer. Um, we have a really good art service called Ask the Nurse. So this is an email service. We're really fortunate. It's staffed by three excellent um, colorectal nurse specialists, they're clinical nurse specialists, um, and they will, you email in your query, um, and it can be about anything. You might have some signs or symptoms that you're worried about and you, you don't quite know whether you want some help deciding if you should go to your GP or, or if you should talk to somebody, you can email that into them. If you're worried about a family history, about tests or about treatment and side effects, anything, please just drop them an email. Um, they'll answer your inquiry within you, two working days usually. Um, they can't give you specific um, uh, clinical advice because they don't know your exact circumstances. But what they do do is give you really good general information that's helpful and they'll give you a very well researched um, and well informed answer. So please do use them. Um, we also have um, a tech support service. So it's um, run by, uh, a, we've partnered with Good Course. It's an excellent course and it really helps in those early days after diagnosis. So people, I, I always think, and patients have often told me that the, the hardest part is if you're once you're told if you are told you have a diagnosis of bowel cancer there's loads of things that can be done about bowel cancer the treatment for bowel cancer is excellent but that period of time where you're waiting um 
for for your clinical team to gather the information they need to to tell you what the most appropriate treatment for you would be can be really a really really anxious time and this really helps with that so there's a thing here called a qr code um that you're probably far more familiar with than i but basically you turn your camera on and your phone you hover you as though you're going to take a picture um, and it will then come up with a thing that you press and you will then get access to this um, course. And it um, enables you to do some relaxation techniques and gives you really good information about sleep and fatigue. Um, so it, it's a really, really useful tool. So please do use that. Um, again, that, there's information about that on our website. Um, we have an excellent forum. Um, that is moderated by um, people who've been through bowel cancer and they know what this feels like. Um, and it's really well moderated um, and a very supportive place. So there are different topics. If you go onto our website, you'll see um, if you're worried about bowel cancer, say if you've got some signs and symptoms, you can you can join into that forum. So you can join it if you want to, or you can just look. Um, if you've been diagnosed with bowel cancer, there's a forum for you, bowel cancer and its treatment and side effects. There's a forum specifically for younger people and the issues that they may face. And there's a really excellent for, um, forum for um, loved ones and carers. So please, please do um, use those resources. Um, thank you for listening um, to us tonight. Um, we've, I'm delighted to say that we've had quite a few questions, Harriet. So um I shall um if it, if it's all right with you I'll um of course I'll, yeah that's great shall, that's great we've got some questions yeah really good so the first one that came through um says um I'm disabled it's a really good question actually um I'm disabled and I'm concerned um that the endoscopy unit may not be willing or able to accommodate my needs um so um thank you for this question so that so this lady has said that she can't lie on her left hand side and she's worried she might be forced into this um, and she's also worried that um, due to mental health that she feels she'd be benefit from a dedicated carer but she's not being offered this so she asked are there any specialist regional endoscopy departments that are equipped um, to adapt to the individual needs of um, disabled patients so shall I take that one yeah yeah, do go for it because I know you've got so much endoscopy experience. So yeah. yeah, so so if every endoscopy unit is very used to um, a whole range of patients, um, and we're very used to um, tailoring our um, tests for individuals, many who have disabilities or have issues, whatever they may be, um, some with the bowel prep, some with having the procedure. So we are very used to dealing with patients with disabilities. Um, I don't know of any dedicated units that, that uh, as you ask, but uh, what I would say to that is most units are very familiar with dealing with patients with various disabilities. So if, if your disability is severe and you might need a hoist or you might be able to lie on your side, as you say, there are definitely ways around that. Um, sometimes we can lay you on your back for the procedure. Um, or it might be that an alternative test is better for you, like we were talking about earlier with the CT colonography. Um, but there's definitely there's, there's always a way around it. Um, and yeah. our key our, our key thing for you um, or that your, your local endoscopy department's key thing will be to try and find the best test for you in your circumstances in order to investigate your symptoms. So um, if you have a carer with you at home, um, very definitely they can be involved in that pathway with you. And we would encourage that. It helps the team at the hospital if you've got a carer with you. Um, and so do try and speak to maybe the unit sister or somebody that um, that you've had some liaison with in terms of planning your colonoscopy. And I'm sure they'll be able to, to help you. But, but certainly we're used to, every endoscopy unit is very used to doing these procedures and people with lots of different healthcare needs. So um, I think you're right to just persist and ask and see what help your, your um, local endoscopy unit can give you. Yeah, absolutely. I would completely agree. And I, ev everybody's different and everybody has different needs um, and um, they will be able to help you. They um, will, so, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you do need to be persistent. but um, Yeah. And, and also very often the angst and the concern that you have at home beforehand, um, if you ask the right people and you get through and, you, you know, you can have your anxieties um 
addressed very often that you know the, the concerns are never as bad as you, as you think because there's there is an answer there's usually a solution so just ask just be, be persistent as Claire says and just ask yeah thank you Harriet that's great um so we've got another question now about the fit test um it's a, that's it's another excellent question so just to clarify will a fit test detect blood originating from the mouth or the upper GI tract um so Oh, you, you can take that carry if you want to I'll, I'll go on carry on sure. yeah so the, the the fit test is designed to pick up blood in the colon um but you you may well have a positive fit test if it is from higher up in the tract but it is designed to pick up blood from the colon so it's not a it's not a fit test to detect blood anywhere in your gi tract um but but we do have patients that have a positive fit and then have a negative colonoscopy and we might then decide to do upper GI or upper GI investigation. So it isn't designed to pick up blood from the, the entire GI tract, as I say. Um, but if you've had a persistently positive fit with a negative colonoscopy, we would pursue further investigations at the top end. Yeah, that's right. Um, and as Harriet said, it, a positive fit, we will always check out we, we will always recommend that you have a colonoscopy, but there are lots of reasons why people have a, you may have positive fit and then, then it's not always bowel cancer, but it is always yeah, so, best to get it checked. Yes. And, and as I say, if you, it's really important that you take the sample when you're not actively seeing blood, if you can. It's not always yeah. possible, um, but if you can, if you've had sort of hemorrhoidal bleeding, um, it's a really it's really helpful if you can take the specimen when you're not actively seeing that fresh blood when you have a poo. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, now we've got another question um, here um, from uh, somebody who says, "Thank you for the webinar. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> joining us." Um, so this is a 44 year old lady. She's waiting for tests at the hospital following a positive fit test, and she says, "I'm absolutely terrified of not coping well." Yeah because I have um, PTSD following the death of her mum from throat cancer. Um, and it was very, very quick from diagnosis to her death. And she was fit and well, as this, this lady is. Um, and she's scared and anxious about the result. Mm. So the question mm. is, is there any support so for, you, for those waiting diagnosis? So there is definitely support. So I, I've mentioned a couple of things tonight, the forum, please do have a look. We've got an excellent forum for people who are waiting um, for tests. Also, our Ask the Nurse service, just drop them an email. Right? Um, it's absolutely fine. Just drop them an email and that they'll, they'll be there to support you. Um, but what I would say is if you are having um, signs and symptoms and you've gone along and you've had, get, you're getting those checked, you've you've done the best thing you could possibly have done which is go along to your doctor have your fit test they ne they need to have a look and it may well be that this isn't bowel cancer but the quicker we pick up bowel cancer the earlier you diagnose bowel cancer the more treatable and curable that it is so please and yeah. I, I know it, it it makes you anxious and i completely appreciate why um but you have done the best thing you could possibly do, which is go along and see a GP and get referred. So please do use our forum um, and our Ask the Nurse service while you're waiting for your test. Hopefully, I, I don't know when your tests, I don't know when your tests are. Um, so I can't see you. just as you're awaiting tests. Hopefully you won't have too long to wait. I would hope you've been referred on an urgent referral pathway. Um, I don't know You're absolutely anything. right, Claire, about, um, you know, lots of people put off going to report bowel symptoms because it's embarrassing. They don't want somebody to see their bottom and they don't want somebody looking into their bottom. Um, and, you know, we we know that we're really, really, really familiar with that anxiety and we take every possible action to try and allay your fears and to maintain your dignity. We have we have some gorgeous dignity shorts that we put you on put, mm -hmm. put on you for your colonoscopy, which are basically a pair of shorts with a hole at the back. And we, everything is done to try and minimise the embarrassment for you. But we don't want you to not go to, to report your symptoms because you're embarrassed about that, because we, we, we just know that you, very often you can have your anxieties uh, put to rest by coming because more often than not, it isn't bowel cancer. 
Um, and you can have a positive fit test for lots of reasons. And as I said before, it's not always bowel cancer. You can have a little bit of inflammation in the bowel that's bleeding, a little leaky blood vessel that's bleeding, a hemorrhoid that's bleeding, um, or it might it might just be um, a, a false positive. And we, we do sometimes see those. So just make make sure that you go sooner rather than later um, and don't delay it because, as Claire said, uh, bowel cancer is really treatable if we catch it early. And um, the other thing that um, there's a follow up to the question, just as I'm also concerned about how I'm managing the hospital as it will trigger my PS PTSD. What I would say to you about that is please just tell them because yeah. they will be so uh, uh, conscious of it if you let them know they will look after you and they'll be able to really support you I don't know where you are in the country but if you came through Harriet's unit or through mine um, and we would you could tell us that from the outset when your first when you have that first telephone assessment um, yeah. from the hospital um, and we would then be able to really help you to, to get through it so please do tell them um, at the earliest opportunity because they will just really want to help you and they will be able to so please don't let that let that put you off and and the sedation really helps you to relax if you have a colonoscopy and you're worried about that the the, the point of the, the sedation the intravenous sedation is to relax you as much as possible so it makes a big difference if you're anxious with, in that regard yeah um she just said thank you you're very welcome um so we've got another question this is brilliant there's lots of questions and that's great that's what we really like so um this is another excellent question so the doctor didn't mention cancer following the endoscopy but biopsies were taken would they still be looking at a can looking for a cancer diagnosis so if they've taken biopsies at the time of your colonoscopy but not mentioned that there was anything concerning, then it's almost certainly, and I really hope so, that the, colos the colonoscopy biopsies that were taken were routine um, because of your symptoms. So we take, we take biopsies all the time at, at colonoscopy, and very often if a patient's had persistent symptoms and we don't find anything, we have a look um, with biopsies under the microscope in case there's a microscopic cause of your symptoms. So that's probably what's happened in your instance. Um, and hopefully you were given a copy of the report. And if it doesn't mention anything about, um, about a polyp or, or, a, or a bowel cancer, then it's probably they've just taken routine samples to have a look under the microscope because nothing was seen with the naked eye. And you should get a letter the, a copy of a letter that will go to your GP as well, um, explaining to you what the what the biopsies were, if they were and quite often you say something like, we took some random biopsies and they were normal. Um, yeah. But they, they will contact you with the results. Um, and you but can don't, don't, Yeah, don't, don't worry about chasing them up if you haven't heard. Yeah. Um, the NHS is, as we all know, isn't foolproof and it's a very complicated organisation. So do chase them up if you haven't heard because sometimes obviously the systems don't always flow as nicely as we'd like them to <laughs> yeah yeah so the advice really I would say um is uh, the same all the way along the pathway isn't it Harriet if you're having tests and you haven't heard chase them up if you've had a diagnosis of bowel cancer and you're worried do ring your specialist nurse we and as Harriet said we, we know we know that People worry about contacting the NHS sometimes because everybody knows it's busy and complicated. But that's absolutely what, what the NHS is there for and what everybody working in it is there for and, and wants you to do. So please don't worry yeah. about that at all. No, um, we rely on you contacting us. <laughs> we do. We do. We're delighted mm -hmm. when you do. So please do. We do. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got the think time for another one, maybe two questions. So and there's one here. Um, so I've had a fit test, it's normal, but I've still got symptoms and I'm, I'm worried, what, what should I do? That's a great question. It is a great question, yep. And I've been dealing with um, patients in exactly this scenario all day today. So um, if you've had a fit test and it's negative, it probably means that there isn't anything sinister going on um, causing your symptoms. But if your symptoms are persistent, it's still important that they're not ignored. So if you've been to your GP um, and they, because your fit was negative, they've said you don't need referral, but you're still concerned that you um, have symptoms that you, you have, don't have an explanation for, then go back to your GP and ask to be referred. 
it might not be that you need to be referred on the two-week wait pathway if your fit was negative, but depending on the nature of your symptoms, your GP may or may not refer you that route. Either way, if you've got persistent symptoms, I would still encourage you to go back to your GP for some kind of referral to, to be assessed by a specialist. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and actually, the other question was about anxiety. And I hope we, we've answered that earlier. If you are feeling worried, um, please do look on our forum. If you're worried because you've got symptoms, um, such as the ones that Harriet talked about earlier, please do go along to your GP. Your GP, like us at the hospital, wants to see you and wants to hear from you. A lot of GPs are doing telephone consultations, but that is absolutely fine. They can talk to you and take a clinical history over the phone. So please do, if you're worried, just get in touch with your GP or if you've already um, been referred or had a diagnosis with your hospital team. Um, so we're, we're out of time. That hour has absolutely flown. So uh, all that remains for me to say now really is thank you so much, Harriet. That was fantastic. Oh, it's my um, pleasure. Re really informative um, and helpful. And thank you. And thank you to all of you for joining us um, this evening. Please do, when we send through the evaluation, please do fill it out for us. It does really help. Um, and we thank you again for joining us at Bowel Cancer UK and have a pleasant evening. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.